Excerpts from The Hypocrisy of American Slavery by Frederick Douglass. Mr. President, friends and fellow citizens, he who could address this audience without a quailing sensation has stronger nerves than I have. I do not remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. A feeling has crept over me quite unfavorable to the exercise of my limited powers of speech. The task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. I know that apologies of this sort are generally considered flat and unmeaning. I trust, however, that mine will not be so considered. Should I seem at ease, my appearance would much misrepresent me. The little experience I have had in addressing public meetings in country schoolhouses avails me nothing on the present occasion. The papers and play cards say that I am to deliver a 4th of July oration. This certainly sounds large and out of the common way for me. It is true that I have often had the privilege to speak in this beautiful hall and to address many who now honor me with their presence, but neither their familiar faces nor the perfect gauge I think I have a Corinthian hall seems to free me from embarrassment. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable and the difficulties to he overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today is, to me, a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. You will not, therefore, be surprised if in what I have to say I evince no elaboration, preparation, nor grace my speech with any high-sounding exordium. With little experience and with less learning, I have been able to throw my thoughts hastily and imperfectly together. Entrusting to your patient and generous indulgence, I will proceed to lay them before you. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your na national independence and of your political freedom. This, to you, as what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance and to the signs and to the wonders associated with that act and that day. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I am glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young. Seventy-six years, though a good old age for a man, is but a mere speck in the life of a nation. Three score years and ten is the allotted time for individual men, but nations number their years by thousands. According to this fact, you are, even now, only in the beginning of your national career, still lingering in the period of childhood. I repeat, I am glad this is so. There is hope in the thought, and hope is much needed. Under the dark clouds, which lower above the horizon, the eye of the reformer is met with angry flashes, portending disastrous times. But his heart may well beat lighter at the thought that America is young, and that she is still in the impressible stage of her existence. May he not hope that high lessons of wisdom, of justice, and of truth will yet give direction to her destiny. Were the nation older, the patriot's heart might be sadder, and the reformer's brow heavier. Its future might be shrouded in gloom, and the hope of its prophets go out in sorrow. There is consolation in the thought that America is young. Great streams are not easily turned from channels, worn deep in the course of ages. They may sometimes rise in quiet and stately majesty, and inundate the land, refreshing and fertilizing the earth with their mysterious properties. They may also rise in wrath and fury and bear away on their angry waves the accumulated wealth of years of toil and hardship. They, however, gradually flow back to the same old channel and flow on as serenely as ever. But while the river may not be turned aside, it may dry up and leave nothing behind but the withered branch and the unsightly rock to howl in the abyss sweeping wind and the sad tale of departed glory, as with rivers, so with nations. Fellow citizens, pardon me, and allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? 
What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And I am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us. Would to God, both your sakes and ours, that an aff affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful. For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? Who so abdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? Who so solid and selfish that would not give his voice so swell the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from his limbs? I am not that man. In a case like that, the numb might eloquently speak and the lame man leap as in heart. But such is not the state of the case. I say with a sad sense of disparity between us. I'm not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems, were inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct, and let me warn you that it is a dangerous to copy the example of a nation, Babylon, whose crimes, towering up to heaven, were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, burying the nation in irrecoverable ruin." Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wails of millions whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilant shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, to chime in with the popular theme, would be treason most scandalous and shocking. It would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject, then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. Standing here, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine. I do not hesitate to declare, with all my soul, that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the provisions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce, with all the emphasis I can command, everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate, I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command, and yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. But I fancy I hear some of my audience say, it is just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind. Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? 
your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But I submit where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point is the anti-slavery creed? Would you have me argue? On what branch of the subject do the people of this country need light? Must I undertake to prove that a slave is a man? That point is conceded already. Nobody doubts it. The slaveholder themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of the laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which, if committed by a black man, no matter how ignorant he be, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of these same crimes will subject a white man to like punishment. What the religious press, the pulpit, the Sunday school, the conference meeting, the great scholastical missionary, Bible and tract associations of the land array their immense powers against slavery and slaveholding. And the whole system of crime and blood would be scattered to the winds, and that they do not do this involves them in the most awful responsibility of which the mind can conceive. In persecuting the anti-slavery enterprise, we have been asked to spare the church, to spare the ministry. But how, we ask, could such a thing be done? We are met on the threshold of our efforts for the redemption of the slave by the church and ministry of the country. In battle arrayed against us and we are compelled to fight or flee. From what quarter, I beg to know, has proceeded a fire so deadly upon our ranks during the last two years as from the northern pulpit? As the champions of oppressors, the chosen men of the American theology have appeared men honored for their so-called piety and their real learning. The lords of Buffalo, the springs of New York, the Fathrops of Auburn, the Coxes and Spencers of Brooklyn, the Gannets and Sharps of Boston, the Deweys of Washington, and other great religious lights of the land have, in utter denial of the authority of him, by whom they profess to be called to the ministry, deliberately taught us against the example of the Hebrews and against the remonstrance of the apostles that we ought to obey man's law before the law of God. My spirit wearies of such blasphemy and how much men can be supported as the standing types and representatives of Jesus Christ is a mystery which I leave others to penetrate. In speaking of the American church, however, let it be distinctly understood that I mean the great mass of the religious organizations of our land. There are exceptions, and I thank God that there are. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? The manhood of the slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that the southern statute books are covered with enactments, forbidding under severe fines and penalties. The teachings of the slave to read and write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your streets, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then I will argue with you that the slave is a man. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. It is not astonishing that, while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that we are engaged in all the enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian God, and looking hopefully for life and immorality beyond the grave. We are called upon to prove that we are men. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty, that he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must they argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is that a question for Republicans? 
Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter beset with great difficulty involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice, hard to understand? How should I look today in the presence of Americans dividing and subdividing a discourse to show that men have a natural right to freedom? Speaking of it relatively and positively, negatively and affirmatively, to do so would make would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven who does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What am I to argue that it is wrong to make them brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, and to beat them with sticks? To flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at an auction, to sunder their family, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters. Must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employment for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? Is it that slavery is not divine? That God did not establish it? That our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There is blasphemy in the thought. That which is inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? They that can, may I cannot. The time for such argument is past. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing arg argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability, and could I reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light what is needed but fire. It is not the gentle shower but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. Its crimes against God and man must be denounced. What to American slave is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year. The gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow muck, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes, which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on this earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world, travel through South America, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last layer of facts by the side of the everyday practice of this nation, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival.